this is a thrill for me. Um, I was joking as we were coming down the stairwell that, that uh, 20 minutes is not enough time, and I was told I won't say by who uh, that 20 minutes is just enough time for uh, a certain person <laughs> to not get into trouble. So, <laughs> we'll see. We, 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 we're at this point um, uh, in, in our history uh, around the country, but I think particularly at uh, colleges and universities and you know, elite colleges and universities, I guess even more specifically, where folks are having to, at last, uh, reckon with the long effects of history. Um, I think there's no problem reckoning you know, with, with the effects of history when those things reflect uh, well upon us, but now uh, we're being forced to reckon with some of those things that don't necessarily reflect well on us. We can see this in some of the name changing that's been requested at various universities because you know, maybe <coughs> things on it, you know, slaveholders. We can see this down in South Carolina with the taking down of the Confederate flag and that ongoing battle in other states. And we can definitely see it at Georgetown uh, with, with, with the recent efforts. Uh, uh, President DeJoya Jack, <laughs> um, I, I, I wonder if you would just start us off by talking us through uh, what exactly is happening at Georgetown right now and Georgetown's own efforts to reconcile itself to its past. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with both of you. Um, we had, an, we had an, a tragic moment in the early years of our history that we've been trying to come to terms with. In 1838, Jesuit priests on plantations in Maryland had enslaved children, women, and men, and in 1838 arranged a transaction to sell 272, virtually all of them, to a, to a landowner in Louisiana. With that sale, some of the proceeds were then sent to Georgetown. And we benefited through, through that sale and the institution of slavery. Do you have a, a translation for what the dollars were then to yeah, today? Yeah, yeah. The, the transaction was worth about, well, $115,000 in 1838, which would equate to about $3.3 million today. The, the first payment, the down payment, which is what we can account for right now, was 25000 of which we received seventeen. And that seventeen would probably be worth about five hundred thousand dollars today. Mm. So, we we didn't actually think that was a relevant number for us mm -hmm. because, as we've unfolded in uh, our work in this process, we recognized far deeper commitments that we're that we are making and we are prepared to make. But about a, about two years ago, we began this work internally of trying to come to terms and reconcile ourselves with our history, and it was. It was inspired by the fact that we had a building named for the person responsible for this transaction. And we were renovating that building. There wasn't a person in our 175,000 member alumni body that could have told you the name of that building, but we knew it had a name and we knew we needed to come to terms with it at that time. The history was well known. We had taught it at Georgetown for many, many years. We had a digital website in the 90s, which descendants have used in the past to try to track down some of their own genealogy. But we knew we had a new moment to be able to engage our community in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been engaged in over the course of the last, the last two years. What, what, what prompted things to go further? Were there protests on, on campus? Did, was there some sort of you know, activism? Or what, what, what was the push? I think in, in our case, what was unfolding in our country, so to just give you a little bit of the arc, we made a decision in, in the summer of 2015 to launch a working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. And that was really to come to terms with that moment in our history. As things continued to unfold externally in our nation, we made a decision in February, and I pulled together a town hall of our community and, and, and gave a talk on racial justice at Georgetown response. And that launched another body of work. So we have a working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation, which just issued its report on September 1st. We have another working group on racial justice, a Georgetown response that is helping us come to terms with the new ways in which we as a university community can engage these questions. And this has been reported, but if you would just outline the commitments that have been made so far. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the easy ones, we made a decision last, last fall to take names off the buildings. We made decisions over the course of the next several months to put names on, on the buildings. Mm -hmm. And one will be named for the, f the first name, Isaac Hawkins, who's the first name on the manifest mm -hmm. of, of the 272 enslaved children, women, and men who were sold. The other is named for a, a free woman of color uh, who 
was a woman religious who lived in the Georgetown neighborhood and um, provided an extraordinary witness during the time in which this all occurred. And the, th that was step one. The one that's probably gotten the most attention has been uh, a, a, a decision that we would regard the children of descendants in the same way we would regard those who have an enduring relationship with our community. These are faculty, staff, alumni who have sustained an enduring relationship. And in the course of our, our, our process of determining undergraduate admissions, we give care and attention in a special way to those folks. It's not determinative in any way. We're a very selective institution, so I don't want to overstate what it means. But it was a, a, an effort to show the kind of respect we think appropriate in this moment. And Drew, I promise I haven't forgotten you, but I'm just going to follow this up really quickly. <laughs> you know, one of the immediate arguments I heard uh, from that was, fine, that's a great step. But what about actual cash support for those students who, who, who might take advantage of that and might be able to take advantage so, of that? So again, it gets a little lost in the complexity of, of financial aid at universities. Mm -hmm. But we're one of 25 institutions. We're, we're, we're both in the same category in this regard. We're need blind right. when we make decisions about admissions and we, are, we meet full need for all of our students. Right. So anyone who's admitted to our university, we don't know their ability to pay when we make the decision to admit them mm -hmm. and then we're committed to covering their full cost. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we would continue that process with every student who would, mm -hmm. be, who would be admitted. We've had descendants who've admitted, we don't know whether they in the past, and we've got mm -hmm. alumni who are our descendants, so we don't know. I, I couldn't tell you whether they were on financial aid or not. Right. It's, it's, it's a determination based on need. Right, right. Andrew, at, at Harvard, how, how have you guys uh, dealt with this discussion? Well, there are interesting contrasts, I think, between our two institutions. We're both venerable. We've been around for a long time, which means that we were part of the nation when slavery was embedded in the fabric of the United States. But Harvard being in New England often was part of a New England consciousness that after the Civil War sort of said, oh, we didn't have anything to do with slavery. But as you know, as a very active historian, in recent decades, there's been much more attention to the presence and indeed strength of slavery, its influence in the New England colonies and then states. Slavery was legal in Massachusetts until 1783, so although we have not yet discovered a moment that is as dramatic as the one you described, we are increasingly aware of how slavery was just part of the everyday life of Massachusetts in the colonial era and therefore of Harvard in the colonial era. We are also aware of how the economic engine that slavery represented for the nation as a whole up to the Civil War. Cotton was the number one export of the United States and up to the Civil War. Uh, was an economic engine for Massachusetts, for many people connected with Harvard, and therefore it supported Harvard in a variety of ways. And so we are exploring that and trying to understand what was the place of slavery in building the institution that we have today, what were the contributions made by slaves, enslaved people, to Harvard's past, and trying to dig that out. Um, we were able to find in some research done by students, actually, the names of f names, particularly, of four individuals who worked in the households of Harvard presidents in the 18th century. And last spring, we put a plaque on a building memorializing those individuals and their contributions as a, as a kind of first step in enshrining the history of, of slavery, embedding the history of slavery in Harvard's understanding of itself. We don't have the extensive records, at least so far we have not found them, that Georgetown has because those records were really generated by business concerns. These were... And also, Catholics keep unbelievably good <laughs> records. <laughs> So we've got birth certificates, <laughs> baptisms, c communions. Mm -hmm. It's a combination. Yeah, <laughs> but slavery being more economically yes. incidental within the Massachusetts economy mm -hmm. has not left the same abundance of written records. Mm -hmm. So we, I've appointed a committee of faculty, historians of various um, specialties to advise me on how to carry forward further research into the history of slavery at Harvard. Mm -hmm. 
and as you know, we're going to have a conference in March at Harvard on slavery and universities. I had the great privilege of visiting the African American History Museum last week, and I was so struck by a quotation from James Baldwin on the wall about history, which said, it's not about the past, it's so embedded in us and who we are in every way. And that to me is an essential part of understanding where we came from and how we build a future that creates students, faculty, human beings, citizens who have the self-consciousness about the possibilities of evil and injustice that we can learn through seeing how our ancestors made choices of the kind they did. And one of the challenges that we have found, one of the challenges, we've known our history, we've documented this history, books have been written about it, websites, and when we announced this working group last, last September, it came as a surprise to people that we had this history. It, it's a, it's, it was incredible for us to acknowledge how much we need to keep this alive so that it is part of the formation of each of our students, each mm -hmm. of our community as we move forward. We, we took for granted that we knew this part of our history and it was informing mm -hmm. the way in which we were accepting our responsibilities in this moment. And, and that was a, both a, a surprise and a disappointment for us. I want to ask you guys just um, a little bit, a slightly more abstract question. There is obviously the direct responsibility which you guys have spoken to, uh, you know, of, of certain universities in terms of, you know, enslavement. Um, but if you think about, you know, the epic of enslavement in this country, there is, you know, I compare it to it's as though, you know, you look at a bomb blast. And then there's everything that happens as a result of the bomb blast afterwards, and if we can follow that rather tortured metaphor through, that would be Jim Crow, that would be Red Line, and everything that originates, all the evils that originate out of slavery, even if they aren't uh, from slavery, po uh, slavery proper. As heads of universities, institutions, that had such a prime role in shaping the leadership class in this country, what is the responsibility of universities like Georgetown and Harvard for those policies, even if you know, it's not a direct transaction. You know, certainly the outsized influence of those institutions in terms of American leadership and, and policy is there. So it occurs to me, you guys are just as enmeshed, even if it's not a direct action. What's the responsibility there? What we've been wrestling with is just that question. And, and our, our best, the deepest conviction we have is how can we best respond in this moment to those fundamental elements that constitute the work of universities. We engage in the formation of young people, we support the inquiry of our faculty, and as institutions we contribute to the common good of the communities of which we're a part. And as we wrestle with those responsibilities, how can we, how can we today respond in this immediate moment to the enduring legacy, the manifestations in this moment of the fact that we never ameliorated the original evil of slavery with emancipation, with subsequent reconstruction, with Jim Crow. It took 100 years to get the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. We're still living with the manifestations of that original evil, and how can we as universities respond in this moment in ways that ensure we're doing everything we can to build a new kind of context for moving forward? I would say a word here about the, his <clears throat> the history of universities which since the end of the 19th century, when the research university replaced the college as the um, instrument of higher education in the United States, <clears throat> I think there grew an increasing sense that there shouldn't be any value judgments associated, not in Catholic schools <laughs> ever, but in the rest of higher education. <laughs> a kind of removal from a sense of commitment to values we're just gonna be objective scientists investigating whatever field we're in. And I believe in the last decade or uh, perhaps a little more, there's been increasing recognition that there is no void within which you undertake objective inquiry. That there have to be certain commitments within which knowledge is pursued and transmitted. And that we have to, as institutions, commit ourselves to undertaking our work and forming young people within those sets of commitments to justice, to truth, to values that matter to us as a society. 
Um, in a way, we're taking a lesson from something that your institutions, Georgetown and others, have, have not abandoned in quite the ways that I think many research universities did. So I'm a big advocate of making sure that we articulate why do we want to know things? What is the larger purpose of this knowledge? And what kind of students do we want to um, send out into the world? We don't just want to train them like automatons. We want to educate them in the larger context in which whatever field they're pursuing will be practiced. And so I think we have a huge responsibility to attend to these many, many issues in, in the field of race relations, in the aftermath of slavery, but in a number of other dimensions of injustice and, and social crisis as well. Can, can I... Um... Can I ask you guys to drill down a little bit more? I mean, maybe it's because I asked the abstract question, but I feel like the answers were a, a little... How does that look? Is this how people teach? You know, I, I, this is the, the answer that's in my head. Like, I think about, you know, Georgetown as, as you know, um, a powerful, powerful institution in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, I was up near Howard where I went to school recently. I was walking through, and the demographics of the neighborhood around Howard have changed quite a bit. Um, and one of the reasons why they've changed is because the population that lives, certainly some, certain people left, you know, because they wanted to leave, you know, decided they wanted to, you know, live somewhere else. But the difference in wealth is very, very obvious. Um, and the difference in, in, the, in the, uh, the abilities of people to remain in neighbors that they, 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 they may be loved is, is very, very obvious. All of that, and we don't have to go through this today, but all that didn't come out of nowhere. All that, you know, the original explosion is slavery. Like, like when you think about Georgetown, What's its responsibility to the broader city, to the specific citizens here? Um, I'll just give you one quick example. Uh, we, we set up a center for health disparities right near the Navy Yard mm -hmm. about four years ago under the leadership of Lucille Adams Campbell. One of, we, we actually brought her over from Howard, one mm -hmm. of the great, great cancer researchers. Damn you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but she runs our center. That's for not helping. <laughs> <laughs> this, but, but under her leadership, we've established a center right in the heart. It's connected to our medical center, works alongside our healthcare partner, MedStar Health. But we just did a, sur we just did a survey for the city mm -hmm. on health disparities. And the findings are so wrenching in this moment, in 2016, that the difference in life expectancy between an African-American man and a white man in Washington, D.C. in 2016 is 15 years, eight for women. We have a responsibility to try to contribute to addressing the, that challenge. Mm -hmm. It's one example. We've mm -hmm. committed to st setting up an institute for the study of slavery and its mm -hmm. legacy, a center mm -hmm. for racial justice, mm -hmm. how we intend to respond as we move forward. But whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in access to educational opportunities, whether it's in trying to help address the impact of gentrification that's occurring across mm -hmm. our city, we believe we have a, a role and a responsibility to play in informing that work and perhaps contributing in meaningful responses. Mm -hmm. I would say similar examples from Harvard. I know that you're very concerned about housing. Mm -hmm. We have a housing clinic that our law school runs and many law students learn how to be activists in bringing justice to housing issues, keeping people from being evicted, et cetera, et cetera, through that clinic. Our School of Education is very involved in the Boston schools and we have numbers of programs that bring students to Harvard to help give them preparation for college, um, early childhood programs in the city, being involved with our communities, but also being involved more broadly than simply in the Boston community mm -hmm. with ways of opening access and trying to mitigate some of the kinds of disadvantage and, and inequality that you're speaking of. Our school public health, similar kinds of things to what you're describing. So we feel a definite obligation and responsibility mm -hmm to use our knowledge in service of the communities in which we find ourselves. And sometimes that's a world community. Mm -hmm. Paul Farmer's work in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a very local community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't want to overstate you know, the, the power that you know, an institution like Georgetown or, or Harvard has, but I, what, what responsibility do you have? And I know I'm talking a lot about responsibility. And that's, that's what the conversation is ultimately about. Um, what responsibility do you have to also urge other institutions um, who you exert, I, I, some level of them, I'm not saying you control them, it's not the Illuminati or anything like that, but 
what responsibility do you have to urge other institutions to do that, that sort of work? And I'm not even talking about merely educational institutes. I mean, you talk about slavery, you know, you're talking about banks. I would argue you're talking about the federal government. You're talking about local government. What responsibility do you have to push other institutions to do that sort of work sure. also? Well, I think embedded in both of our responses just, just a moment ago is the fact that we often will work with other kinds of, of organizations and community and and city agencies and the like. We, we can't do it alone as universities. So finding those partnerships is very important. I think also you should know that the conversations that are taking place on both of our campuses are reflected in many other campuses. And we're, we're part of a, a, an organization, Universities Studying Slavery. And we have um, both the University of Virginia and, Will and William and Mary both provided leadership in helping establish this as a kind of a, an academic project across higher education. Mm -hmm. I think also embedded in, in, in Drew's earlier comment and things that you've written about, the, we are in a moment of extraordinary scholarship. Mm -hmm. Some of the greatest scholarship that we've ever seen is being written right now, built on, on the foundation of some other great scholarship mm -hmm. that began in the mid-1950s that you've written so beautifully about. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is an incredible moment for our, for our institutions. We're exploring those ways in which we can be we can find new ways of being a university by engaging these questions in the most, most serious way. Mm -hmm. And I'd add to that, we've been talking about what we do as institutions, but of course one of our fundamental, our, if not the fundamental commitment of a university is not just research, but it's teaching. And it's the kinds of students that we educate to take up those roles and to become the influencers and the leaders themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to recognize the ways in which I mean, we were just preceded on the stage here by Sylvia um, Matthews Burwell, mm -hmm. who I proudly claim is a Harvard alum, mm -hmm. who's doing all this work in healthcare mm -hmm. and healthcare disparities and so forth through her secretaryship. So those kinds of contributions through the people who leave us and take their work and their education to new heights mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. the institutions we, we are part of. Mm -hmm. um, Drew, I, I, want, I want to ask you to, to do something. I, I don't know if you guys know. I mean, Drew Gilpin Frost is obviously, you know, the president of, of Harvard University, and that, you know, comes with a kind of esteem. But this is one of our finest living historians also, um, to my mind. So it's actually been... Um, <laughs> she is... I mean, she's actually part of why I'm here having this conversation with her right now. So it's been a little hard to not fanboy out. Um, <laughs> okay, but I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it, guys. I promise. I'll say that for backstage. Well, that makes my month, <laughs> year, life. <laughs> but but Drew, I, I do want you to just to take a moment. And uh, Jack, I know you just did a little bit of this. But if you would just take a moment and put on your historian hat for a second. How did we get here? Is this the result of that you know, work that began back in the 60s, you know, when folks began to, you know, revise these sorts of narratives of slavery, civil war, all that. What, how did we get to the point um, where we're having, I mean, I, there are those of us, you know, and I, you know, I include myself in that camp who, you know, pushing for more, want more, but I, I'm sort of amazed at this, you know? I mean, when I think about it in the long sort of span where you go from a situation where folks are denying that the civil war was even about slavery, you know, respected historians denying mm -hmm. it, you know what I mean, in, in the early 20th century to be here now, what, what, what's changed? Well, I thought about that a lot last week when I went to the museum because I began graduate school in 1970 at a time when there was just beginning to be a history of slavery. There'd been all kinds of controversy in the 60s about whether or not one could know anything about slavery, whether there was the basis for a history of slavery because Slaves didn't sit around and write in diaries and serve on government commissions and leave an extensive written record. And the way history operated as a field was to turn to those kinds of sources. So a lot of my cohort of historians began to think about what other kinds of sources can we find? How, how can we recreate this history? And the museum, the first section of the museum from the slave trade up through the Civil War is in essence a product of that work and of transformation, not just of the history of slavery, but of the way history is done using quantitative materials such as records of the slave trade to be able to recreate patterns of human lives of individuals who never had a chance to leave a diary like George Washington's letters or a record like others 
uh, the memoirs of Grant or something of that sort. And yet, ingenious work with quantitative materials can recreate much of that experience. Folklore, um, material culture, all kinds of ways of creating a past that was denied before this wave of historical research. Mm. So I think we're building on that transformation of not just our historical record, but our historical capacities. And that has brought us to a time when we can ask questions that people would have just said couldn't be answered mm -hmm. before. And we have many, many people who are asking those questions, but also I think a kind of frustration, which Jack was talking about. You put that out there and people say, what, huh, I didn't hear about that. For me, the key moment was when Michelle Obama said at the convention, a house, we live in a house built by slaves. And there was all this noise. And people no, said, it wasn't. huh, what, huh? really, huh? huh, And that to me just embodied our failure to yeah. move beyond this extraordinary work that historians were sharing with one another to a more public sharing of our collective past. I think the museum is going to do an enormous amount of work in that regard. I think the efforts at our universities will bring that to light, particularly in New England, where this denial went on longer than it did in relationship to slavery in the South. This is work that needs to be done and needs to be shared much more broadly. And so I believe we have been in a moment of transformation, a long moment of transformation, if you take a moment to be from 1970 to now. But there is significant change that I can see in the, in the span of my career in the field of history. Well, thank you, Drew. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, guys. Hope this was enlightening. Thank you. <laughs>